Okay, well, thank you. It's nice to be here, and now I'm finally in the situation that others can heckle me instead of the other way around. <laughs> so, I'm going to, or I was asked to talk about some work on magnetization switching in nanometer sized particles and, and thin films. But I thought I wanted to start a little bit further back, since I tend to think about magnetization switching in, as one particular example of metastability. And so I want to start by talking about magnet, uh, metastability and finite size effects in metastable systems. That's the point, viewpoint I'm coming from. So what is a metastable? Well, it's basically a phase that appears as if it were in equilibrium, except it ain't. It's, so the free energy is not fully minimized, but there's a local minimum, so, so that if you do slow and weak disturbances, perturbations to the system, it will basically respond as if it were an equilibrium system. But if you either kick it hard enough or wait long enough, you'll find out that hmm, it's not equilibrium after all. There's a classic example that we've all heard about, and which actually I you know, should think happened here in the mountains, doesn't happen much in Florida, is under cool water or freezing rain. Where, so we know that normal water, pure water, can be supercooled quite far below zero Celsius, and it will stay liquid until you somehow kick it. So, on the other hand, the escape from metastability is essentially irreversible, at least on an, uh, on an astronomical scale. Because once your, say, your uh, water has frozen and it's kept below zero Celsius, it's not going to become liquid again, however long you wait. Now, I'll stay with water for a little while and give you a little history lesson here. So, I, so this is to my knowledge, the first ever obser experimental observation of the decay of a metastable phase, and it is indeed the freezing of supercooled water we're talking about. So this is a paper by Fahrenheit, the very Fahrenheit of uh, the Fahrenheit temperature scale, who reported this in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of London back in 1724. I had seen a reference to it, and I must say my face dropped some, somewhat when I got the interlibrary loan copy and discovered that it was in Latin. <laughs> but uh, luckily I found a German translation later, so I've actually read the paper, and it's a charming paper, so let me take uh, just a little bit of time to talk about it. So what happened was that Fahrenheit was testing out his new instrument, the thermometer. So, and the way he did that was he would measure the outside temperature and then in order to decide whether it was freezing or not, he would put little bulbs with water outside and see if they're frozen or not. So what he would do then to make the water as pure, pure as possible, he would boil it so the glass bulb would fill with steam, melt it all, let it cool, so essentially, so that's why this says experiments and observation on the freezing of water in under true vacuum. So that was his way of getting true vacuum. So then he, of course, discovered that there were days when he would come out there and his thermometer was clearly showing that it was way below freezing, but his control experiment, the water was still liquid. And so his first theory here, which he states very clearly, he says, first I thought this would have to be because of the vacuum. 
And so that is indeed what he has retained in his title. And he kept on doing this until one day, and he writes this in the paper, that's, that one day the weather was really nasty and he decided to take the bulb of liquid water inside before he would re break the seal and see it free. So what, that's what he did. He broke, he broke the seal, air rushed in, and he saw the water free, so obviously it had to be mechanical because of the vacuum. So one day then, he, it's too cold out there, he takes his bulb, he walks, and he stumbles on the stairs, and he shakes the bulb. And here he sees the water freezing without the air coming in at it. So he says, aha, then I understood it wasn't the vacuum after all. So this was actually in 1721, and then he says, well, the next winter wasn't cold enough to continue the <laughs> experiments, and the year after that he said he was too busy, I don't know whether his grant came up for renewal in 1725 <laughs> or something, at least then he finally decided that he would publish this to the edification of others who were taking delight in nature. So, anyway, that's, to my knowledge, unless someone can come up with something from Aristotle or something like that, this is the first experimental observation on metastability that I know. Now, you have an older one? No, <laughs> but you can't expect super cool in Greece. Well, well, um, the Olymp, the Mount Olymp or something, but maybe they didn't go there. Okay, so now of course I'm going to go into stuff that you all know very well, so I can probably go a little fast for a little while. So now going from the real world of super cool water, which I'm not going to talk more about, I'm going to the little theoret theoretician sandbox of using models. So here I have it just a ferromagnetic easing model, in other words, I take J positive, and here's a little picture, so the spins could be either up, plus one, or down, minus one, and as we know, the order parameter here is the magnetization, which is simply the average value of the spins, so. We also know, of course, that the easing model has a phase transition, so that above the a critical temperature, it's essentially this order. Below that critical temperature, if I have zero field applied, it has two distinct but degenerate ordered phases. Say most of the majority spins up, majority spins down. And if I'm below Tc here, so at h equals zero, then we have the possibility of coexistence between the two phases. Like you would have coexistence between an ice cube and fluid, liquid water at zero degrees Celsius. Now, well, if we apply a non-zero field to the model, then essentially we destroy the phase transition at the critical point. So now, instead of the magnetization going to zero in a singular way at the critical point, it will come down in a perfectly analytic way, slowly making its way to zero. Or if I apply a negative field, it will come in like this. Now, we want to say, but what happens if I cool the system and have it probably in one or the other of the states, for instance, magnetization <coughs> down, and I apply a small up field. So here I've done the green lines here are the equilibrium magnetization at a temperature below the critical temperature. I'm not, I'm going to stay below critical temperature in everything I'll be telling you about. So, let's then make a 
thought experiment that we just say increase the field a little bit, make it a little positive, or if we had the positively magnetized before, apply a small negative field, and we'll wonder what happens. Well, we know that as soon as I make the field positive, the equilibrium state will be positive, and so it should go there eventually. The question is really what eventually means and how it depends on the size of the system and the strength of the field. And that's really what I'll be talking about most today. So, well, let's so far leave this as an open question. We know if this were water, so that this, say, is where ice, and this were water, and this was actually then temperature, the water, ice is a first order temperature driven transition, then, well, we know that we can certainly do supercooling. Experimentally, just as uh, Fahrenheit told us, we can actually cool liquid water well below zero. So, so what's going on? What can we say here? Well, before I... So now I'll, I'll stick with my toy systems. And, of course, you all know that if you want to play with easy models, the Easing model is not a real a quantum Hamiltonian, and so you actually it doesn't have its own dynamics. You have to actually give it a dynamics. And so let's just talk about this in the guise of a simple Monte Carlo simulation. I'm just doing the simplest <coughs> Monte Carlo algorithm here, nothing about speeding up or anything like that. Just say, I have a lattice, I choose randomly a site on this lattice, and I make a proposal. I propose a spin flip. So, then I can answer, the, the, the system answers yes, with a certain pro uh, probability, W, to go from its original spin state to the opposite spin state, or with probability 1 minus W, it says no, I'd rather stay where I am. So, now, the only really, the only requirement I'm going to use here is that my transition probability is going to eventually lead me to equilibrium. That I can ensure by ensuring detailed balance. And just two, two very commonly used dynamics that satisfy detailed balance is the metropolis, which says that if the spin flip would lower the energy of the system, then I accept it with probability one. And But if the spin flip would increase the energy of the system, then I accept it with this probability that looks like a Boltzmann factor. And I could show that this dynamic leads to an equilibrium probability characterized by a Boltzmann distribution between up and down states. Another very popular one is Glauber dynamic, where I choose where my W takes this form, they're similar but different. Bauber's a little easier to work with uh, analytically because it's a continuous function at delta E equals zero. Metropolis is a little faster in simulations. Neither of them are terribly realistic in terms of real systems, so there's lots of other dynamics going on that have inserted between the spin states barriers of some kind. I'm not going to look at those here, but essentially very similar results can be obtained with those. So I'm going to stick with the simplest points we have here. Now, unless you are specialists in metastability, 
you're probably, your knowledge of man's stability is probably from some textbook, which is telling you that essentially that which is giving you a mean field picture. So we're saying that I have a free energy density for the system that, or, that looks like something like this, like some local, some function of the magnetization, and then minus the field times the magnetization. So I have a... Can you see this, or do I need, need a little bit of light for a second? I mean, it's essentially the same graph I have there. So then, if the field here is zero, this function u should be symmetric, and very often we use what's known as the 5-4 field theory, something like that looks like this. A zero field, these two minima have the same free energy, they are degenerate. If I increase the field, then I will lower the energy of the positive magnetization and increase the energy of the negative magnetization so I get something that looks like this, where now this is the global minimum and this is my metastatic stable minimum. If I See, I can do without the light again. Maybe I can learn where this switch is. Okay. Thank you. So, as we increase the field, we come to a point where this metastable minimum goes away. That is known as the spinodal field. And for a simple model like the phi cube, the, the 5 board field theory that I sort of drew on the board, or this one, which is a Curie-Weiss field theory. It's the same thing, except that, that it goes up with a logarithmic divergent that's at plus minus one instead of going up as uh, m to the fourth, but it's the same thing. So I can find analytically the value of this spinodal field. I can also find that the, that this spinodal field, if I take it in terms of the temperature distance from the critical point, it goes as Tc minus T to the big three halves. It's not a terribly important point in my story here, but at least for, for completeness, we should keep it. Is the point the, the spinodal field in terms of the temperature independent of your choice of potential? No. Uh, uh, the, this power for, for something that, lo that low, that believes as a, that be behaves as a power field theory for small m, this t to the, uh, t minus, tc minus t to the t halves is universal. But it does not depend on the exact way that the order parameter is kept is uh, kept from going to plus minus infinity. Okay. So, well, real most real systems are not completely uniform, and essentially we need to produce some fluctuations that are in some sense of a critical size. The small fluctuations from near this metastate stable minimum, if it's just fluctuates a little bit around there, they would decay <coughs> back to this minimum. So we need fluctuations that sort of jumps over the hill there, the barrier. So therefore, I can say, well, my nucleation rate, if I sort of, as I assume that the system is close to equilibrium, near its metastable equilibrium. Then I can look at these small fluctuations as equilibrium fluctuations, and I can then use a Boltzmann factor to say, to give the, roughly the probability that I find a fluctuation that takes me 
so up to the to the barrier free energy and over. So here now, and this is an important thing, what I drew here is the free energy density. Here, this is the total free energy of the critical fluctuation, and that will depend on the details of the model. For a mean field model, where, said, where there are, or a complete mean field model, a uniform model, there are no, the only fluctuations in the system are fluctuations of the total magnetization. The system is uniform, and so the free energy is simply the volume times the free energy density. The free energy density is independent of the system size, and I multiply it by volume, you see this parameter goes to infinity, and so the metastable state in a mean field model is infinitely long -lived. Uh, just another little historic sketch, seeing that nucleation theory really has been interesting to a lot of great luminaries in physics. Van der Waals, Maxwell, Gibbs. One way to deal with, with uh, this is analytic continuation of the equilibrium free energy into the metastable state. I'll just touch on it because it, it's a field theoretic me method. I'm not much of a field theorist. This was essentially done by Langer in the late 60s and showing that for models like the Glauber or Metropolis local dynamics that we showed you, you can show that the nucleation rate, uh, rate uh, is proportional to the imaginary part of the free energy. Let's see, zero for H, nucleation, yeah, right. Okay, and we can show, for instance, for the mean field system, as I said, the critical fluctuation now is the whole system, and so imaginary part must then be zero if I, my field is weaker than the spinoval field, and if it's stronger than the spinoval field, then we can show that the lifetime goal is that. Goes, uh, let's see, this is the nucleation rate, yes, so the nucleation rate goes to zero as I get close to the spin over. Now, most of my lectures I will be talking about systems with short range interactions, like the nearest neighbor easing model. But I just want, but there are also some physically interesting systems that have long range interactions. For instance, systems with elastic interactions. Or people, uh, people have been looking at earthquake faults as an example of long, weak long-range interactions. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about it because, really, because lately I, I worked a lot on these long-range systems back like 15 years ago, and then over the last couple of years I found myself getting back into that with uh, colleagues at the University of Tokyo in connection with, what, with what's known as uh, spin crossover materials. So here's just, now if we realize that in the long range systems, the critical fluctuation, which just becomes a uniform change in magnetization when the system size goes to infinity, is some sort of a ramified droplet, very spread out, very difficult to observe in, in a system. So, let me take this as an example that simple model of the spring crossover material. What I can do, so that's a material where that contains it's a molecular crystal where the volume of the individual molecules depends on some interior state. 
You can call it a spin, and sometimes it is a magnetic spin, sometimes it's not. But it's essentially a binary, or so I have some sort of local bi-stable situation, and there's a an energy difference between the stable and a met metastable state. In this case, what I call the low spin state is stable, the high spin state is metastable. The trick here is that although the energy of the high spin state is higher than that of the low spin state, the dege its degeneracy is also higher, and therefore, when I heat the system up, the entropy effects will tend to favor the excited state. And so this is a system where the stable high, high temperature state is the, the high spin state. So I can write a system like this as a with an effective local interaction which has the energy gap here and then the the degeneracy comes in as a time dependent field, a uh, temperature dependent field. This may be a, be a little easier maybe to see in, in the next. Okay, here's. Yeah, and so we will give this system now elastic interactions. And very often, if you have a system with elastic interactions, they essentially induce dipole, dipole, or some sort of multipole, multipole interactions that are of long range. So let's now assume that the fact that these systems have, these molecules have different sizes, and they're coupled by springs, mediate our interactions through the system. Now, that would, if I leave free, free boundary conditions, that would give me a distortion of the system. I can set up an order parameter here, just like I do in an easing model, which just then becomes my fraction of high spin. And I call that, I'll call that my magnetization. So that's just giving us a pseudo-magnetic language. <coughs> I can do Monte Carlo simulation in this, in, a, in an ensemble with constant number of particles, pressure, and temperature. So, I'm not going to go into details of that. Essentially, what happens is that in addition to my usual Ising dynamic, which could be metropolis, I also, at the end of every Monte Carlo spin, I will have to change the total volume of the system. Now, go back to this effective field thing I said. So that's a, a way where I can use an easing model actually to make myself something I could think of as a temperature-driven first order transition. So if I'm at high enough TC, then because of this T here, I, if I change the temperature, I also change the effective field. But I will go through H equals zero above the critical point. And so I will see a smooth behavior here. If I change the temperature in such a way that I go through the critical point, well, then I get a critical type isotherm. And if I cross it below the critical point, I'm crossing a coexistence line, and I will get a jump, or if I don't do this in infinitely slowly, I will get hysteresis 
that is another manifestation of metastability. So, in this system now, one way you can get the system into the high temperatures uh, or the, the high, uh, high spin state is to blast it with light and excite the molecules that way. And what we find that essentially the light intensity we can think of as an effective field. If the light is too weak, then the system will stay essentially in a metastable state, metastable low spin state. If the light is strong enough, it will jump to the high spin state. Here's and here's the. Uh, the steady state magnetization as a function of field and you see it's a very strong and quick change there. Can you explain on the previous slide that your effective field is a function of temperature? Why is that? I don't think you can explain that. Okay, it is because of the degeneracy. So this spin this state Although it has a higher energy, it also is more highly degenerate. And therefore, if I heat it up, I, the going into the high temperature state will increase the entropy. Logarithm of the uh, degeneracy times temperature. And so if I heat it up enough, temp uh, the, the temperature uh, the entropy field the term which is proportional to temperature will win and it becomes the equilibrium state. So therefore now instead of having a sum i h sum sigma i which is the usual field term in, in an easing model I have this temperature dependent field which depends on the energy gap and of the temperature to the degenerates. Did that clarify? So This is basically an entropy effect. I'm, I'm, it, the entropy comes from the degeneracy because K log, log G, right? And so, therefore, the degenerate state has the higher entropy and when you increase the temperature, it will be likely to go. Now, one thing we would see if we do a simulation in this system, just as I sketched very quickly there, one thing we'll see is that the crust, even as the system changes from low spin to high spin, I don't see a very compact growing cluster. I see something that looks very much like the ramified cluster that I was predicting in the mean field case. And that, so that's what I'm seeing here. This is just a snapshot of our, of our simulation. And there's actually, you can do finite size scaling calculations here. And one can show that at the spin noble, just the uh, crossover where the field becomes strong enough to actually switch the magnetization. The, the waiting time, or the time it takes to go from one state to another, increases with system size, with the number of spins in the system as n to the one-third. This was actually shown by Kubo and company back in the early 80s, and by Binder and cohorts in the 80s. Sorry, the 70s and then Tinder in the 80s. We re-derived it again a little while ago. If you are outside the spin oval, then the time de uh, diverges as I get closer to the spin oval. If I get inside the spin oval, there is a free energy barrier to get over, and I get an exponential lifetime just as I would expect for me to there. So basically to find the spin value of my now H 
stands for the white intensity. All I have to do is to plot my, the log of my lifetime, or my life, my life, plot my lifetime versus the number of spins to the one third, and where I get a straight line, that's my spin all wall. So then I can actually come up with the spec, the scaling. This is really just a repeat of what I said on the previous slide. I can drag these together in a single scaling function, and so here's really our result. I've only here you actually see as soon as I get a little there's a crossover regime close to the spin oval where I just have this uh, n to the one third and if I get in way into the metastable phase I have this exponential uh, I can also see if I look at the ratio of standard deviation to average if it's in a metastable region, then I should have a Poisson process. And so the variance and the standard deviation should be roughly equal, and that's also what I see, that going into the metastable state, indeed, the, st the statistics of the switching becomes more and more exponential-like, or Poisson-like. Okay, here's just another example. I think I'll skip by it. This is another textbook example known as the Fushimi temporally or the weak long range interaction model. You've probably seen it in textbooks. You can simply have each spin in the system interact with every other spin with an interaction constant that, that is inversely proportional to the number of spins. And that gives you mean field results. Now, time is ticking. So I want to get into my main theme. I just wanted to show you that mean field results are not just poetry, but actually also occasionally prose. <laughs> or not fiction, but occasionally non-fiction. So now let's go to short range force systems. Then the critical fluctuations are very different. Now, instead of being this sort of almost invisible uh, fractal-like structure, it's a compact cluster, and I can model it as a sphere, or a d-dimensional sphere in d-dimensions. And so, the free energy now of such a sphere, I can set, uh, uh, forget about these three factors, essentially that is proportional to the surface tension of the interface between the inside of the sphere, which is the, in the equilibrium phase, and the background, which is in the metastable phase. So that goes, as you know, the area of the sphere goes as its radius to the d minus 1, where d is the dimension. Then, so in other words, the bigger it is, the more surface free energy. On the other hand, as I, the larger the interior gets, the more, the bigger the volume that is magnetized parallel to the applied field. And that goes as radius to the power d. So, if I sketch this, then this is a function that increases for small radii, comes to a maximum, at what we call the critical radius, and then falls off. So in other words, if I make a small sphere like this, and let it alone, with very high probability it's just going to shrink back into the metastable state and dissolve. If I make it big out here, then it can gain free energy but simply by growing, and so it will grow with very high probability. At the critical size, it's roughly half and half. Probability of one half of growing or shrinking back. So, others, we don't really need to worry too much about the exact values of this, the surface tension, the spontaneous magnetization. But you see then, the critical radius, just by 
taking the zero of the derivative of this thing is going to go as one over the field. I think this thing is getting a little weak and we all go low tech. So here, so one over field and then the nucleation rate, I can also find, so now I calculate the free energy barrier, the difference in free energy between there and there, that will then gives me something that goes as 1 over field to the d minus 1 in the exponential here. So, you see the picture now is very different from the one I sketched you from the long range force system because now there is no Lo no st sharp spin over. I have no metastable state that would become infinitely long lived if the system gets infinitely large because I have cheaper fluctuations. I have fluctuations that cost a finite amount of free energy that just depends on the size of the fluctuation and has nothing to do with the size of the system. So that's a very different situation. Uh, yes. Uh, how, how is the uh, nucleation rate calculated there? Uh, how do you uh, it's, uh, it's simple. Uh, essentially, again, saying that the probability of having an excitation of given free energy is e to the minus uh, f over kt. And so this is the free so. This psi, which is essentially just the, uh, the surface tension divided by field over d minus 1, is the free energy barrier. And so just the probability of getting a fluctuation is. Uh, Prefactor are almost is very, very hard to observe in the first place. So they are, they are known exactly for the, uh, for the 2D easing model, and we've made some attempts at measuring them. I'm not going to worry too much about them here because it's really practically always dominated by this exponential. Thing. So how do you obtain the free factor? Uh, some pretty complicated field theory calculations. It's essential. Go back to papers by Lang and by uh, uh, I'm just I'm just blanking on the names, but they, these were uh, these they were calculated by back in the so They're calculating the instant. Yeah, yeah, it's instant time, but it's uh, I say for the gross. Features of metastable decay, they're not terribly important. Now let's go to another old theory. All of this is old stuff, really. So, and look at first what's known as Abrami's Law, or the Kolmogorov Johnson Mill Abrami theory of metastable decay. Goes back to a series of papers published right around 1940 by these gentlemen. And essentially, it says that I can find that the interface is increased, the interface grows, it moves <coughs> in the direction to increase the amount of equilibrium phase. And that that feed, that velocity is again roughly proportional to the applied field. It's so rel relatively intuitive. The stronger, say, I have a flat interface. If I have zero field, it's just going to sit there and fluctuate a little bit. Apply a field, it's going to sweep sweep in the direction of of making the system equilibrium. It's not exact, but it's good enough. If I know that, then I can, if, this, if I take this at face value, then I, and I say, okay, at every time there's a probability of nucleating a new supercritical droplet somewhere in the system. 
therefore the total probability of nucleating is proportional to the to the nucleation rate, which I have calculated already, times the volume of the system. So here then is omega d is just a volume factor, depends on the temperature on the volume. This is in, integrate this. This is the volume of this is the volume at time t of droplets that nucleate in at time equal to zero. So do this integral, and you find this rather, rather a nice result that I can calculate the magnetization as an exponential function of time divided by some characteristic time to a power that's the dimension of the system plus one. It's, it's pretty interesting because it's very simple. It just say, throw throw in mu clusters, sometimes they overlap, and you, if you calculate the overlap, correct for overlaps, correct for double overlaps, triple overlaps, and so on, you'll discover after a few corrections that you're in the process of writing down the, the Taylor expansion of e to the minus x, and that's why it is where this exponential comes from. So here's a picture here from a Monte Carlo simulation to the Easing model at 0.8 TC fixed field. So starting from a magnetization of one, applying suddenly a field, and this is a 256 by 256 system, and you see this quite characteristic. Also, if I were to plot this one versus T cubed, I would actually get a uh, or Let's see, log of m versus t cubed, I would actually get a straight plot. That's not as an atomic plot, I'm not going to show it here. What I want to talk about now is what happens if the system is not infinitely large. The Abrahami theory, as I sketched it here, is for an infinitely large system. So, now, well, if I have a characteristic growth <coughs> rate, and a, uh, and a characteristic time. Then multiplying a velocity with a time, I get a distance. So there's a characteristic size in a system like this that you can, is essentially the, the size that a droplet will grow, grow to on average before it bangs into another droplet. I'll show you pictures of this in a second. Now, I had my nucleation rate that goes as e to the minus 1 over h to the d minus 1. From this, I can then calculate the, the time and r naught from, from the from the Abrahami theory. And then we can start asking about what happens if the system is bigger than R0 or smaller than R0. So let's try to think about this. Well, the first thing we could ask about is what, what happens if the system is bigger than the critical droplet? Now, I showed you a few slides back that the radius of the critical droplet goes as 1 over field. So, therefore, if the system is smaller than the critical droplet, well, then it can't accommodate a full critical droplet, and some non-critical fluctuation will be enough to flip the magnetization. And such a non-critical fluctuation, in this case where I'm working with periodic boundary conditions, that essentially has a free energy that's the surface tension times the area of an interface cutting across the system. So the system sort of the droplet grows and grows and then it just sees itself and says, hey, I'm, I've switched the system. Now let's go, so that's sort of 
one way of looking at it. Now, let's assume that we have an intermediate size where the size of the system is somewhere between the, so it's less than the average distance between droplets. But it's bigger than the critical droplet. So we can form critical droplets in the system, but it's likely that that critical droplet will have time to grow on the, to be on the order of the system size before it runs into another droplet. In other words, before a second droplet will have had time to nucleate in the system. So that's what we're seeing here. I'm starting saying white is the metastable phase, black is the stable phase. Actually, this is cheating because I've taken these pictures from a, from a uh, paper on a, very, on a non equilibrium system that turns out to behave very similarly. But story and model of CO oxidation. But anyway, the physics is the same here. So these little, look for instance, this crop cluster here has evaporated to over here. So it's sub, these are sub, although you can see them, they're subcritical. And most likely they will, if I had run your movie here, it, I would actually see these sort of blink, flicker on and off. And then you see over here, where I don't see anything in this, or maybe I, I do, these guys probably somehow coalesce, or a new droplet here, suddenly I have a supercritical droplet. And you see now that grows and grows and grows till it sees itself, and till it fills up the system. Now, as we said, the nucleation of a single droplet is essentially a Poisson process with a lifetime that is given by the free energy of the, drop, of the critical droplet through this Boltzmann factor. And then, well, since the rate is proportional to the volume of the system, the time is inversely proportional to the volume of the system. So in this regime here, the bigger the it will have a Poisson process type new decay process. In other words, it will sit around and you'll see nothing, and then suddenly a droplet will nucleate and boom. On the other hand, as I make the system larger, the average time for this Poisson process becomes shorter and shorter, inversely proportional to the one. Now what happens is L is much larger than that characteristic length. Well then, you essentially have Abrahamian's law again. Remember the little caricature with overlapping circles that I drew you? And here we see a simulation. You see now, from here to here to here, these droplets are all supercritical. Now, they all grow, grow, coalesce, and take over the system. And then the lifetime is this T naught, this characteristic uh, time that came out of doing that integral in the Abrahamian in the Abrahamian theory. So you see, it's a very different. Let's plug flash back here. So here I have, there's two differences here. One, I both have this exponential with 1 over h to the dimension minus 1. If you look at the next one, you see, but you see in the multi-droplet regime, as we call it, there's this 1 over d plus 1 factor that comes from the integration in the, in the Abrahamic theory. On the other hand, here, there is no volume dependence. Maybe a weak one due to pre-factors, pre but let's not worry about that too much. Oops. Uh, on the other hand, 
as we saw in the single droplet regime, I have a one over volume free factor. So let's see what, where this brings us. Well, it essentially brings us to where we can say what that there's a characteristic field now where the system size is of order R0. And I can just set, so I set system size L equals R0, solve this, and I find a field, and we tend to call that the dynamic spinoval point, or the dyna dynamic spinoval field. And as you see that, it is certainly true that if the system becomes infinitely large, then this field goes to zero, except really at t equals zero. Uh, but then, but the convergence here is one over log one over log l to the one over d minus one. So in two dimensions, it's one over log l. And uh, then, in addition, I could say, well, what about the first? thing I said, if the L is equals the, the critical size, well, then I get this 1 over L divergence, which is sort of way down here compared. And on the other hand, I can say now, what if the critical droplet is of the order of the lattice cutoff? Well, then every, every fluctuation is supercritical. And we call this for the the mean field spinoval, that's not a very good name, but it's sort of stuck. We haven't come up with anything better. So now I could make a metastable phase diagram here. So that's what I'm showing. So here is field. Here is T over TC. So here is TC. Here, well, this is my metastable, uh, my mean field spinoval, which is essentially just the, given by the ratio of the surface tension to the, to the <coughs> equilibrium magnetization. So it's a smooth curve. Then I have the dynamic spinoval, which comes like this. And then this is a con, let's see, it's a convex curve. Goes down to zero near the critical point. And you see, as I increase the system size, it slowly creeps down to being something that essentially is zero for all non-zero temperatures. However, this is a very, very, very slow convergence. I don't have this here, but Mark Novotny has amused himself by trying to, to say, well, now if the lattice constant is one nanometer, you can, and L is the side of a football field, you can actually still easily see this curve on, on this. So, yes? Is this for 2D or? This, uh, this is shown, this is for 2D, yes. But uh, it's uh, similar for 3D, although I admit we haven't done that many simulations in 3D, but I'll show you one that, that shows how this goes. So, so here now is the single droplet regime is when, when you're at low enough temperature or weak enough field that the system decays in a Poisson process via a single droplet. If I'm outside that but inside this, this uh, strong inside the string, strong field limit, you're in the multi droplet regime where you're well described by Abrahamis law. So let's see how this looks then. So here's some two and three dimensional simulations. Here's two dimensions. I'm, show, I'm now plotting log of the metastable lifetime, which in the simulations I just uh, set equal to the time it takes for the magnetization to reach zero. It's as good as any. Maybe I can say some other cutoff. But I just take a cutoff that's well on the on the side where it's running downhill in free energy. And so log of that, well, we had this e to the 1 over h to the d minus 1 
So I take the log, that gives me 1 over h to the d minus 1, and I plot versus that. So in 2D, I plot the log of the lifetime versus the inverse of the field. So strong fields now on this side, weak fields on this side. And here are straight Monte Carlo results, these uh, points with error bars. Here are some rather fancy simulation methods that I'm not going to talk about, that's mo mostly due to Mark Novotny, and what, uh, which allows us to, to go to very weak fields, or very, uh, so here actually, so here you see that this is my single droplet regime, and then so then when I get into the multi-droplet regime, I get a different slope. This slope is one-third of this slope, 1 over d plus 1. Remember, the, in the exponential factor, the single droplet had just 1 over h to the d minus 1. The multi-droplet had that multiplied by 1 over d plus 1. So here, and I can measure, so this slope here is one-third of this slope here. And for the smaller system here, we are actually able to trick our ways up here where you're, you can start seeing a crossover to the, uh, what we call the coexistence regime, the very weak regime where the system is smaller than the critical drop. So this was D equals 2 and then we have D equals 3, essentially the same story, but then with a different ratio between these slopes there, this ratio is roughly then one four. And my plot versus is one over h squared. Now we're going to more or less end with our one of our with our world record. This is a calculation using a projected dynamic simulation with uh, moving with a moving wall where we're essentially pr pushing the system over the metastable hill and then we can we can extrapolate from that that to find the time it would go over the barrier if you didn't push it and using that method we estimated for a 16 cube Glauber easing model in three dimensions at 0.6 TC and time is in Monte Carlo steps per spin from on the order of 1 to 10 to the 60th. And by the way, just to get some idea, we're into such big numbers these days, but the, the lifetime of the, of the universe measured in femtoseconds is about there. So that really brings me towards the end here. I really just set the stage talking about metastability. It's, it's common in a lot of systems. Of course, the other isn't even talk about diamonds, of course. Diamonds, as you all know, I'm sure, is just the metastable phase of, of carbon. And waiting long enough, they should all revert to graphite. On the other hand, it doesn't seem that has for De Beers too much. So, and as I will then talk about next time, a magnet that is ma magnetized in a direction that's not parallel to the applied field is in a metastable state. That was, of course, the, the model we used here, but I will try to at least now connect it to real magnets. So ferroelectrics, very similar to ferromagnets, super cooled, super saturated liquids, the quark gluon plasma, I mean, is the universe really in its ground state or are we in some metastable state? Well, if we are, we're not going to live to not. <laughs> Unless, of course, it's a single droplet and the, <laughs> and the droplet is out there somewhere. So, therefore, the interplay here of nucleation and growth is, a, is 
essential to understand the decay of meta stability, especially in systems with uh, finite force range. Because you're, even though a supercritical droplet has nucleated, if the system is large enough, it takes time for that droplet to flip the system. And during that time, other droplets may nucleate if the system is larger. So we have to think about both, nucleation and growth. Only the mean field and the long-range force systems have a sharp spin oval in, in the sense that you're used to seeing in the textbooks. And on the other hand, the short-range force systems have crossovers that we can talk of as size-dependent spin ovals. Yes? So Maybe you're going to talk about this later uh, in your next lectures, but I'm just going to ask it here. Have you guys considered, uh, for example, three state systems where you have two competing metastable states? Yes, I was not planning on talk, talking about that, but we have actually for, uh, we haven't done that for short range, but I have done that for a long range Bloom Capella model. We did that with a graduate student about 15 years ago. But, uh, yeah. Maybe I can talk to you about that. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll be happy, and I, I actually got the paper in, not in, in here, so I can show you. Okay, so that's, uh, okay, so these are my two remaining lectures. Talk about dynamics of magnetization switching. Tomorrow, Wednesday, I'll talk about hysteresis in magnetic systems and models of magnetic systems that are driven by an oscillating field. And then actually on Thursday I'll be given an informal lecture on some stat, stat mech applications to ecology and evolution. And with that I'll just show you a picture of a system that has just left its metastable state. <laughs> When you were talking about the spin, the spin crossover materials, it appeared that you were using open boundary conditions? Um, uh, no, actually we were using, uh, uh, the picture I was showing you where it contracted, that was open boundary conditions. But uh, our, our simul the actual simulations where we see the mean field like transition, that is periodic boundary conditions. And that is a point that's a little fishy, but we are essentially making the point that if we look at a macroscopic crystal, then it's large enough that locally that it can't really change its volume or it will crack. But um, that's a good question to ask, yeah. In what, in what sense this is a mean field theory? After all, you're using this uh, infinite type result, which is not a mean field. It is a mean field. It is mean field in, in the sense that the the, interac the interactions are long range. They're pro prob because the elastic interaction essentially gives rise to a di effective dipole-dipole interaction or an effective multipole interaction. And therefore, every the, the spin state of every molecule in the system interacts weakly with the spin state of every other molecule. And, and that's that's enough. So basically, the system then will will behave in a way that's very very similar to this long weak long range interaction model, where every spin in, in an easing system interacts with every other spin with an interaction j over n, where n is the number of spins. So that's you know to do that and take n to infinity, you get directly to the to the field. So is Abrami theory, theory is a kind of mean field theory, although a, diff a different kind of mean field theory, because the system is not uniform there. I mean, uh, but uh, Abrami is mean field in the sense that I'm looking, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm, I'm focusing on one specific kind of fluctuation, namely the nucleation and growth of supercritical droplets, and everything else 
is uniform. But it's not a mean, so it's, in that sense, it's sort of a mean field spirit, but it, I'm not, but it's not the theory that describes interactions, be, in energetic interactions between different parts of the system. I don't know if that. Okay, so, so basically, maybe it's best if I don't think of it as a mean field theory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can I comment? Um, yeah. So in this context, mean field usually means that the fluctuations about the instant time solution are negligible. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's... Yes? So have you worked with even on all the experiments when you are not well to adjust to know the the world of the temperature when you can't assume that your drop is a circle and there are large large fluctuations when you can't even do it? That is I am not I have always tried to stay safely below the critical temperature. Things you you can write down scaling relations that contain both that contain both H minus H de novo and T and T over T C and uh, but uh, I have not personally tested anything there so I would numerical calculations. Okay, if there's no other questions, we'll be go to break and come back to